Thank you. Everybody hear me okay? Okay, great. Good morning, my name is John McDevitt. Um, I'm a, a local guy, actually outside of Philadelphia, but I do a lot of stuff down here in the Bay. Uh, I, I have an affection and an interest in marine electricity and marine fire protection. <clears throat> I'm a member of SAMS, AMS, for you know 10 years or so. Uh, I've been a member of 302 for 20 years. I think Ken's actually been in there a little bit longer than me. Um, I'm chairman currently. Um, Typically, that's for two publishings. I was chairman for the 15 edition and, and this edition now. I've been a member of 303 uh, for uh, over 15 years anyway. Um, <clears throat> uh, past instructor, Marine Electricity, ABYC, and I've been a certified Marine uh, ABYC electrician for since 2002. Um, I, I spent a lot of time as a yacht broker as well, so I've done a lot of surveys on the other end. Um, I formerly worked for Blue Water Yacht Sales, and I uh, ended my, my tenure there December 31st, so I'll be doing more of this kind of work uh, in the future. <clears throat> I have a 100-ton master's license. I've done over 100 trips up and down the coast. I did the Great Loop twice and got paid to do it, um, and I've owned boats for over 30 years in Chesapeake Bay here. Uh, this is going to be a fast-paced PowerPoint presentation. Uh, we're going to cover a number of things. I'm going to spend some time on recapping the ground fault issues we see in, in marinas and on boats right now. I'm going to cover the boat side. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the marina side as well. Um, there'll be a, a, an opportunity. I have a couple things that we should put in our radar. I'll spend a little bit of time on. And then I've got some pet peeves and things that I see on surveys that we uh, uh, probably should pay a little more attention to um, as, we, as we go forward. Uh, I have some equipment with me that uh, when my program's over, I'll put on the table up here. Uh, you can see what I have. Um, you know, maybe we could power some of it up at break. Uh, I'll be here for the day, so I'll leave it there for the, the day as long as it's not in the way of anything. And uh, you'll have an opportunity to ask some questions. Uh, we're actually up and, and see some of the gear I have there. Uh, three types of equipment on boats. Uh, this is be a pretty basic coverage. AC alternating current, DC, direct current. And uh, when I teach class, uh, particularly to boat owners, I have a, another electrical system that I call the GC system. And the G stands for green. It also stands for grounding and bonding. <clears throat> AC power is dangerous. It causes fires. Uh, black wire, red wire are hots. White's neutral. Green is grounding. Uh, AC equipment requires a high voltage to operate. All AC circuits must be protected by the proper size circuit breaker. Examples of AC power produced are uh, the marina's transformer. Uh, that produces the power. The, sometimes the circuit uh, occupies a large field, which is where we get into the electric shock drowning issues. Uh, and then on board the boat is the generator, which is a very narrow or restricted field of electricity. Uh, DC power, of course, batteries, red wires hot, yellow or black is ground, uh, special colored wires for lights, bilge pumps, and, and the like. Uh, DC is somewhat inert. Uh, usually when something's not working properly with DC, uh, the, the device operates sluggishly or maybe not at all. Uh, all DC circuits must be protected by a circuit breaker of some sort with the exception of the uh, cranking engine cranking motors. They're the only DC circuit that does not require proper um, circuit protection. <clears throat> and then the GC wires, there's this, this could be all kinds of different electricity. Uh, none of it is productive. The AC and the DC currents are productive. GC is not. It's, it's, there's other reasons there. A, a properly operating boat should have no current running on the grounding equipment. Um, 
the, we have no way of knowing when it's working properly. When the AC is not working, the air conditioning doesn't work or the TV doesn't work or something doesn't work. When the D or circuit breaker trips, when the DC is not working, we have sluggish appliances and things like that. But the, the GC system and those green wires, we don't have any way of knowing whether they're working properly or doing their job at all. <clears throat> a D GC are, are two, th or actually three different things. AC grounding wires. Sometimes we need a DC grounding wire when we're dealing with a device that shares AC and DC electricity. Battery chargers, inverters, things like that. You need a green grounding wire on the DC side. And then the, uh, the third component of the GC equipment is the bonding wires. And once again, this is a very minimal amount of electricity that runs on these bonding wires and corrosion uh, and, and things like that inhibit or, or prevent the, the efficient use of the bonding system. I pulled my boat out of the water a couple weeks ago and one of my zincs looked very, very good uh, compared to the other. So somebody might say, well, uh, you know, that, that's good. You know, your zinc's only, only half of them disappeared this year. And it's probably uh, an inefficiency in my bonding system is the reason that zinc didn't, didn't deteriorate as it normally does. So I've got some work to do over the wintertime to make sure my bonding system is, is tied together. I see a lot of this. This is yellow wires on a fuel tank. Should be green. Somebody coming onto this boat when it's two years old to put a stereo in may see the other end of those yellow wires and say, oh good, I got a DC ground. He installs the stereo, grounds the stereo to these yellow wires, the other end of these yellow wires, and every time the stereo is on, the tank's energized. Black wires, same thing. Black wires have their purpose and their place. Bonding is not one of them. And many times when you do this, the other end of the black wire may get uh, confused for, uh, um, other than what it's intended. Uh, all the green wires on the boat, they all are connected together. The, uh, uh, this is an ABYC graphic, but you can see here the, the AC grounding bus, all the AC grounding conductors, the uh, DC grounding bus, DC negative. And no matter how it's done, it's done. It's, it's accomplished. These things all get connected together to the same grounding connection. So all these things reside in the same place inside the boat. <clears throat> Rules and regulations for boats, of course, ABYC. We're all familiar with the ABYC. Um, NFPA 302, I'm chairman for that. Ken's been on the committee a long time. Um, uh, commercial and pleasure motorcraft, we're looking at uh, some of the sub chapter M stuff. We wanna be consistent with that right now. And uh, there's a couple different entries that will go in the next publishing of 302. Uh, that uh, might keep us in harmony with the subchapter M. Uh, I, I don't see a lot of uh, ground fault protection stuff with the sub M stuff. Most of those uh, fields are above on tugboats, which are small fields, and I guess they don't have the issues that we have with pleasure boats. Ground fault protection uh, recap. Uh, ground fault protection has been required in the United States since 1968. Uh, the boating industry is still playing catch up when it comes to ground fault protection. We have standards and requirements right now, but now the devices are starting to settle down and go onto the boats as well as the docks. And we'll talk a little bit about both. Um, these are the standards, ABYC uh, 11, E11, 11.11.1. Uh, .11 .11 uh, I, I won't read it other than to say, uh, they call it an LC, which is pretty much their terminology. Uh, but the, the, the basic parameters are 30 milliamps on the trip level and 100 milliseconds on the trip time. Uh, 302 pretty much says the same thing, 100 milliamps on the trip time, 30 milliamps on the trip level, and, um, and that's pretty much what we're seeing on the boats these days. So what's the difference between this, the old hot water, the James, James Bond movie, the hair dryer in the tub, I don't know whether everybody's old enough to remember that, but, and this. Well, the, the difference is, the hair dryer has ground fault protection on the plug and it's been a requirement for a long time. The, uh, the boat, it is a requirement, ABYC since uh, December 31st of 12 um, and the 2015 NFPA 302 came out with it. Uh, but we still don't see it on boats the way we'd like to. And what's the difference between this? We're all familiar with that. We see it in our homes, kitchens, 
bathrooms, and this. And, and the answer is, uh, this is ground fault protected, and that marina power pedestal still is not. And, and, and the marina sector on, on this is the next big hurdle, in my opinion. Uh, <clears throat> uh, ground fault on the hairdryer and the receptacle in the home, they're redundant ground fault protection. There's one on the device and one at the outlet that provides the power. Um, on the, in the marine environment, nine out of 10 boats still don't have it, maybe even 95% don't have it. And in the marine is almost 100% still don't have ground fault protection. Just to be clear on the differences, a, a circuit breaker is an over protection device, uh, over current device. Uh, so if you have a 50 amp breaker, it's designed to trip at 51. If it's a 30 amp breaker, it's designed to trip at 30, 31. Uh, whereas a ground fault device is something that measures the legs. And let's say in the case of a 30 amp 110 line, it, it measures the difference between the the current coming up the wire and down the wire. And if it, if it degrades to five milliamps, it will trip a five milliamp breaker. So it just measures and makes sure that there's a balance between the current carrying legs of an AC circuit. <clears throat> the parameters of ground fault protection are the milliamps measured, and we basically see three, five milliamps, that's what you have in your home, 30 milliamps, that's what we have on a boat, and 100 milliamps, that is what the old National Electrical Code called for on the docks, the 2011 and 2014. The new 2017 National Electrical Code calls for 30 milliamp on the docks. Uh, some people will say five milliamp protects people, 30 milliamp and 100 milliamp protects equipment. Um, some people may disagree with the 30 milliamps. It, it, it does protect people as well, but in a proper environment, 30 milliamps can still kill somebody. Uh, also measured in milliseconds. So these devices have to trip at a certain time so that there's uh, uh, not an extended period of time where somebody can be impacted by that. Uh, ground fault protection can be an outlet or a breaker. We're familiar with ground fault protection as outlets because we've had them in our homes for a long, long time. Uh, but I've seen ground fault protection as a device and not an outlet. Some examples, uh, there's an alphabet soup with this, GFCI, ABYC calls theirs an LC, uh, RCD is what you see in Europe and overseas, residual current device, and you may see it a, a number of different ways. Uh, GFCIs, ground fault circuit interrupters, uh, they frequently feed other outlets, and the nice thing about that is if it feeds two or three more outlets, they all receive the same protection as long as they're wired into the GFCI properly. There's a clear cut line and load in a ground fault device. So the power comes in the line and the load is the downstream part. <clears throat> uh, GFCI protection is required in boats, in heads, galleys, engine rooms, and on decks. And I'm talking about the 15 or 20 amp household type devices there. And they have been for years. Uh, most of the time, I, I, there may be an ignition protected GFCI out there now, but I don't believe there is. And, uh, and they should be tested regularly because they're mechanical devices that need to be um, exercised and, and probably don't have the, the same life out on the deck of a boat as they would have in your bathroom. Uh, National Electrical Code has had the ground fault protection requirements for 50 years now, and we still don't see them as we should in the, in the boating industry. The electric uh, leakage circuit interrupter came out, that's ABYC's definition it's a, a 30 milliamp device it needs to be installed somewhere immediately inside the boat there's a 10 foot rule that we are familiar with for overcurrent protection and it, it applies to this as well um, the newer boats typically i'm seeing the uh, overcurrent protection and the ground fault protection near each other somewhere near where the electricity enters the boat in this case you could see here's the uh, the power intake for this boat here. Here's the two overcurrent devices right here. And then up here is the uh, ground fault devices for both legs. Um, most new boat builders are putting them in the same place and they're someplace immediately inside the boat's electrical system. This is a box that Viking use, uses. In this particular uh, box, uh, 
they're only using one 50 amp, so it's probably a smaller boat, but they'll take the same boat with two 50 amp shore power connections and put overcurrent protection here and here, ground fault protection here and here. This is pretty common ground fault device. I think the company called Lifeguard or something. I actually have their literature in, my, in a folder here, but I, I see that a, a fair amount of times. <clears throat> Uh, this is another boat. Here's the overcurrent protection, and here is the LC, the, um, um, the ground fault protection. This is a, a British boat. Overcurrent protection is at the top. It's 250 amps uh, circuits, and ground fault protection is down the bottom down here. Uh, it, it should be installed someplace immediately inside the boat where it's easy to find if you're looking for it. Um, and uh, uh, if there is overcurrent protection, it should be someplace nearby. Uh, the, the ABYC for, rule for overcurrent protection is it must be within 10 feet of the entrance to the boat or the connection to a cable master. So most of the bigger boats now, the electrical panels will be up inside. So you're going to have to have some kind of uh, preliminary circuit protection inside the boat. <clears throat> The ABYC and the uh, NFPA uh, ground fault requirements should be implemented on new boats, and I and I believe to, for the most part they are. But unless the boat is, you know, if the boat's six years old, it probably doesn't have ground fault protection. <clears throat> Spend a minute on isolation transformers. Um, isolation transformers are uh, usually uh, 50 amp services, 240 uh, volt boats. Um, Four conductors uh, are typically what you find on 50 amp services, uh, but a, a, an isolator, a boat with a, a transformer, an isolation transformer does not require a neutral. So a lot of times I see problems. I had a, a yacht broker come in who took a princess out of the water um, and, and saw this where the neutral was blocked off. And he thought it was, uh, um, something wrong with the, the way they wired the boat and he took a hacksaw and cut the plug off, walked in, put it on my desk, said, this could have killed somebody. This is an improper wiring. I said, well, the boat had a transformer. It doesn't need a neutral. So he had to pay like uh, three or 400 bucks to put the new, new connection back on there. So you can see a lot of times in the cable master that a, a transformer boat has a, a slimmer uh, power supply to it. <clears throat> Transformers have to have primary and secondary protection, overcurrent protection. So the first one is protecting the transformer from anything that may go haywire on the dock. The second overcurrent protection is protecting the boat from any kind of problem that the transformer may have. So it's usually two. Uh, if you pop a breaker, sometimes these things aren't as assembled like these two are here right behind the transformer. Sometimes they may be hard to find. And if there is 10 feet of power or less, 10 feet of cord or less between the entrance to the boat, which is the shore power connection on the boat, or uh, the, the terminated connection of a cable master, if there's less than 10 feet, you don't need an LC. You don't need an electric leakage circuit interrupter. You don't need ground fault protection. If that wire is more than 10 feet, ABYC wants you to put an elect a, a um, ground fault device in there to protect that. 15, 12, 20 feet of wire, whatever it may be. Some things that uh, I think we need to put on our radar right now, um, and they, they all are uh, things we, we should pay attention to. Maybe if you're looking for stuff to read over the winter, uh, there's a lot available online, but the first is energy storage systems, ESS. NFPA is active uh, right now with a number of uh, programs. Uh, it's a very broad based. Um, um, category. Second one is synchronization of AC sources. The ABYC has a standard on this now, it's maybe eight pages, but over the years this standard will grow because the, the uses of multiple AC sources will increase. And then the last one is electric marine propulsion, electric motors. <clears throat> Let me go back. ESS, synchronization of AC sources, electric marine, marine propulsion. And as we move forward, we're going to see these th three things incorporated all in the same vessel. 
Energy storage systems, it's happening all around us. Viking Yachts in uh, New Jersey produces their own power and it keeps their costs down during the day when they're working. It keeps their power costs down during the day when they're working. At night when they're not working, that power generating equipment sells electricity back to the local electrical authority. That's just an example of what's going on. Um, uh, you see the windmills, uh, you know, electricity uh, for the typical consumer, big city areas where we've had brownouts and things like that, in some cases blackouts, um, it's because the peak demand uh, on a hot summer day, um, the, the grid can't keep up with it. So now they have these energy storage systems that are buffering the demand at high points in time. And, and, and they're, they're really at different levels at different places in time. We're familiar with it in the boat business with uh, um, uh, the panels and the uh, lithium ion batteries and things like that. But this is only going to in increase. We're only going to see more batteries on boats. And um, as this filters down, uh, um, we need to pay close attention to it because the energy storage systems will be um, more and more so as we move forward. <clears throat> Uh, the next one is the synchronization of AC sources. Um, the ABYC has for years, we always had the break before you make switch on the, on the a AC side, uh, but there is opportunities now for multiple AC sources to work on the same boat, and we have to synchronize that and make sure that we don't uh, cause any of the problems they were worried about in the past. Uh, the AC, AB ABYC A32, Power conversion systems, I think it was first published in 16, maybe. Um, standard is a guide for the design, construction, and installation of electrical and electronic power conversion control and equipment systems. And the examples are moldable shore power sources. Um, where you may see them is generator and inverter situations where inverters are supplying loads and all of a sudden the, the battery source, source for the inverter is, is declining and a generator will automatically kick on and bring that back up to uh, where it needs to be. Um, uh, shore power and inverter conversions, uh, multiple generator sources. There may be a generator on the boat that only takes care of the inverter bank uh, of batteries. It turns on by itself and turns off and uh, multiple inverter sources. <clears throat> One of the simplest examples of this is pretty common now. Uh, this is a boat with two 50 amp services. The uh, uh, transformers are down below. Uh, and typically when you have a boat like this, you may have one of them on a hot summer day pumping 48 amps and the other one pumping three amps. And uh, this is a, a PM3, which, which brings those two loads together and synchronizes them so that they're both doing 24 amps and not, not overloading one circuit and, and not the other. Electric marine propulsion, ABYC again has a standard. We see this stuff a lot. There's companies that are investing a lot of money right now in electric marine propulsion, outboard motors, inboard motors. Uh, ABYC's standard is E30. Uh, this is also new, maybe, maybe even this year or last year. Uh, the standard is a guide for the design, construction, and installation of AC and DC electrical systems on boat for the purpose of propulsion. <clears throat> There's environmental advantages to this. There's a, a, a improving upon limited range in the past. If you had an electric boat, it could only run so far and run so fast. But the, the, the new technology with batteries are giving these boats a little more range. <clears throat> Costs are coming down and enhanced new battery technology is making all this possible. Torquedo is one of those companies. Uh, they've got you know, their own batteries, their own electric motors, outboards. Uh, everybody's probably familiar or heard of Duffy. It's an electric boat, small you know, battery boat. Elko's been around a while, but there's a resurgence in these companies. There's money being invested in these companies right now, and they will be players in, in the electric uh, motor end of things. Aquawatt is another one. Um, and Quietly researching all this electrical um, engine and electrical motor um, 
material is Honda, Evan Rude, Mercury, and Yamaha. <clears throat> there is on the larger side, there is diesel electric propulsion systems that we now see where a tugboat may be working diesel engines when it's actually working, but when it's moving from one place to another, it may be running off an electric bank. Um, we see the conversions a lot. I, I attended the uh, tug and barge conference in Philadelphia in May, and they had about two or three different presentations from high-end people like Worsilla and companies like that about their intentions to uh, share uh, electrical technology and diesel technology in the same vessels. And you can even find it in blue, large ships like this. So, you know, the mid-range where we all live, we're getting, we're seeing the electric motors in the small boats as well as, as the bigger boats, and it won't be long before it all filters down. Um, I mean, the boats that I, I just took a, a, a princess yacht off the ship, a, a British company, uh, on Tuesday and ran it around a Viking for them from Philadelphia. And we were doing 28 knots with 1,200 mans, and I'm having a hard time seeing that happen with electric motor, but who knows, maybe someday it will. Okay, so do your homework. Just to review, if you want to pick up something and read this, uh, this winter, uh, Energy Storage Systems, ESS, you can go on NFPA's website. There's a fair amount of information there and, and any other big companies that, whose footprints are in the electrical side of things. Synchronization of AC sources. We're going to be bringing AC sources on board. They're going to synchronize and harmonize so we don't have the, the problems that we anticipated before with two AC sources and electric marine propulsion. As I said, this is gonna be a pretty fast paced presentation. If anybody has any questions on the boat side, uh, you know, just speak up. If not, we'll have some questions and answers afterwards. Steve. Yeah, uh, that, that, you know, I mean, the electronic aspects of these boats is, is going to, you know, continue to expand. And I think it falls, at least for now, on the device manufacturer to put something in the equipment that provides some kind of circuit protection that can be reset or replaced so that that doesn't happen. But, but I think as this whole electronic uh, environment expands, that's only gonna happen more. I, I took a, a, a Princess Yacht to Florida uh, in December, and we left the engine start batteries on um, overnight. We had turned them on so we could look at the fuel gauges, and something in the battery charger, uh, while it was on probably two o'clock in the morning, some kind of spike or something, uh, um, took place on, on that, that engine. We couldn't start it in the morning. Eventually we had to reset it and there was a button we could reset down in the engine room on the control box. But I don't see that kind of problem, you know, getting any. Yeah, I, I think the other equipment was on there probably because the manufacturer, the equipment did something to buffer that kind of situation where, you know, there's so many new players selling their electronics into the boating business that we, um, you know, it's a new venture for them and they're not familiar with the, the environment that the boats live in and that their opportunity to be hit by lightning. Okay, let's, let's get into the marina side. I mean, this is a surveyor's class and that's the boat end, but I see the marina side as being a real problem when it comes to electricity. Uh, a number of us have relationships with marina managers and, uh, and you know, at some point in time, we may want to talk to them about them. Uh, the National Electrical Code is the law. 
every state adopts the National Electrical Code in one form or another. Sometimes the county can do whatever it wants. Sometimes the county can do whatever it wants as long as it doesn't uh, circumvent what the state has. Uh, so it needs to be more uh, robust than what the state has approved. Um, and the adoptions usually take a long time. The 2017 National Electrical Code has been out now for over, well, it came out in the late 16, um, but most of the states are still using the 14, and some of the states are still using 2011. So the rules all change. Uh, a a after the state adoption process takes place, it's my opinion that the marina managers don't have a clue about how to manage their electricity. That's a general statement. There are some that are very good. Um, and, and to go along with that, the contractors who 98% of what they do is in buildings, commercial and residential, and then they go down the dock and they don't recognize the differences between what needs to be done in a building and on land as opposed to what needs to be done in the water. Um, and then lastly, the AHJ, the authority having jurisdiction, who needs to go in and write the permits and inspect the work that the, the local contractors do, they don't know the rules for the marina either. National Electrical Code 2017, as I said, it came out in late 16. It's been around now for a while. Here is the states uh, as of January 1st, uh, this, this, the first of the year this month. 27 states are using the 2017, have adopted the 2017. 16 states are still using the 2014. One state till, still using the 2011. And three states still in the 2008 where there was no groundfall protection at all. So as much as this, the National Electrical Code is a great standard, um, it generally isn't adopted by the, the, the uh, states and for some time after it's published. There's a section in this, yes sir. Yeah, it's it. Yeah, it's 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 hard. It's uh, and and that's not a lot of money until some is it fresh water. Yeah, I mean that's not a lot of money until some kid falls in the water and 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 dies and then and, and it's. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've, I've been involved with marinas that have gone through that and I get phone calls from people. I get phone calls from state inspectors who, who, who are checking boats because, and, and in some states, Arkansas, uh, Mississippi, Tennessee, they've all had well published uh, dual fatalities, multiple fatalities of kids. And the state, you know, regardless of what they've adopted with the National Electrical Code, the states come out and said, you need to do this. And they're going down, and, and I kind of get into that a little bit here, but they're going down the dock and these boats are having problems. And, uh, uh, and, the, and the owners of the boats are indignant. Not my boat, but, but I'll tell you right now, if I went to a marina, and now it's wintertime here, and tested 100 boats, more than half of them would have enough ground fault problems to trip a breaker. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a real world thing. And, and th these devices don't lie. You know, the owner will tell you, well, that's your, your power pedestal's not working, but his boat has a groundfall problem. And that's, that's where the biggest problem is right now. Um, but I, I kind of get into that. We'll get into a little bit more. Um, uh, Article 555 is uh, the marinas and boat yard section. It's about seven pages. But as I said, it doesn't get appreciated by the local contractors and the AHJ the way it should. Uh, I actually have the book with me here. I'll put my stuff on the table and that book will be there. You guys can pass through it as well. I also brought NFPA 1, uh, which is the National Fire Code. And in Maryland, it's the state fire code. And right at the beginning of the Marinas and Boatyard section there, it says that you, you need to follow 
the rules and regulations in NFPA 303. And I can tell you right now, there's marina managers out there that don't even know what it is. There's also a, a section on floating buildings. If you know a, a fuel dock that's got a little boat building in there, it's got, there's a rules for that. And uh, uh, if you have a fuel dock, a section 514 part, uh, 514.3 uh, talks about the electricity for fuel equipment. NFPA 303, the current standard right now is uh, 2016. Um, there's a number of things in there that, that we should know even when we're doing surveys ourselves. Um, na National Electrical Code for Ground Fault Protection, uh, the overcurrent protected devices that supply the marina, boatyards, and commercial and non-commercial docking facilities shall have ground fault protection not exceeding 30 milliamps. In 14 and 11, it was 100 milliamps. Now it's down to 30 milliamps. And in 17, they expanded the requirement to private docks. It never uh, was private docks before, but I mean, I have a customer that I sold boat to a couple years ago, and he called me and asked me about his, uh, and he said he was gonna do the electrical on the dock. I said, make sure that you put ground fault protection in for any household devices and for your, for your 50 amp supply to your boat. And uh, I saw him, you know, a month or two later, and the, the contractor talked him out of it. So he didn't get it. So uh, uh, also new for 2017 is Marines have to have signage. It, there needs to be signs uh, approaching the marina that warn of electrical hazards in the water. Don't enter the water around boats that are plugged in. Groundfall protection has been in Europe on the dock for decades. I was over in England at, at Princess Yachts and I walked around and, and took some pictures. This is a, an old uh, primitive uh, shore power pedestal and it has um, overcurrent protection for each and every slip, overcurrent protection for the power pedestal and residual current protection for uh, ground fault for all three. So as you said, in this case, if there's a fault, that power pedestal goes down only. <clears throat> Here's another example, another power pedestal. Overcurrent protection and ground fault protection in the power pedestal, been there for years over in Europe. <clears throat> ground fault protection, uh, the problems are ground fault protection designs, as you talk about. I was involved with a marina not far from here. Um, they had an older section of the marina and they built a new section of the marina. And uh, they finished the docks during a week they were still building the buildings and they sent an email out to their people and said, bring the boats down this weekend, bring your boats to the new slips. There were four docks with 20 slips on each dock. They wired the dock to the uh, 2011 and 2014 NEC requirements with 100 milliamp protection at the head of the dock. So three boats come down, plug into the, 20 slips there, three boats come in, boom, whole dock shuts off. So then two boats come down to sea dock, plug in, boom, the whole dock shuts off again. So they did what was required with the 100 milliamps at the head of the dock. But, but the problem was they, even with the three boats there, they couldn't tell which boat caused the problem. So long story short, they called the people and, and told them, don't come down, go back to the old marina. And, um, and they got some portable, which I have in my next slide, uh, ground fault equipment that they took to the old marina, plugged into the power pedestals, plugged the boat into the ground fault protection device, and if your boat tripped the device, you couldn't come to the new marina. <clears throat> Still, the, the problems persisted, um, but uh, I'll get into that a, a little bit. The other thing is ground faults are prevalent on boats. Um, there's, there's just, it, it's sometimes the people that build the boat wire it wrong. Sometimes it may be an appliance with a strap on the back that, that uh, brings the, the, the neutral current over to the grounding device. Um, uh, sometimes it's uh, owner operated, you know, somebody doing their own electrical work that causes the problems. But, but believe me, there's far too many problems on boats with ground faults right now that uh, um, is going to be the part of anything you're trying to do. Uh, unreasonable boat owners. I mean, I get these state instructors call me once in a while from Arkansas or Tennessee where the state has their own laws now separate the National Electrical Code. And these guys are going through marinas and, and, and the boats all have faults. And of course, the, uh, 
the e either the inspector or the marina manager is upset because the um, um, the customer, the boat owner, insists it's their problem and not his. And, and the other problem we have are the techs aren't really trained real, real well. I mean, they, they to understand, you know, what's going on in the boat and why it happens. There's a few ways to to do that to to get to the bottom of it, but you need the right equipment and you need the right expertise. This is a portable ground fault device that that marina actually went out and bought. You can you can make one of these for under 500 bucks. Um, they have 250 amp, a male and a female, and there's the ground fault device. This particular one has overcurrent protection and ground fault protection, and they took it to the new marina, the old marina, unplugged the boat, plugged this into the power pedestal, and plugged the boat into that, and told the guy, go in and turn everything on. And the hot water heater had to be making hot water, so you had to turn the water on, so, and the battery chargers needed to be charging batteries. And more than half the boats tripped this 30 milliamp device. So they had problems on their boats and couldn't come down to the new marina until they fixed them. Here's a, another uh, Band-Aid. Um, this, this same marina that, that went ahead and was somewhat pioneering when it came to ground fault protection, somebody would come in at a transient. And they would be spending the money to, to stay in their slip for, for three days, uh, four days and three nights. And they would plug in and trip the, the uh, ground fault device. So the marina bought transformers and they would take the transformer out, set it next to the boat, plug the boat into the transformer, plug the transformer into the power pedestal and the transformer would manage the ground fault conditions on the boat. <clears throat> Ultimately, as you say, the way to do this, if you're going to go with the 100 milliamps at the head of the dock, you could do that, but you can slow them down. There's a lot of times there's a speed adjustment on those devices. So you can actually slow the dock down so that if there is a bona fide problem in the dock wire, it'll trip, but it won't shut the whole dock off when you have ground fault problems in one slip. And then this, this here might be a little hard to see, but, but here is a 30 amp breaker and a 30 amp um, ground fault device. Here's 50 amp breakers and a 50 amp ground fault device. Uh, here's your 50 amp supply. There's a household 15 or 20 amp outlet, ground fault in there. This is a, a switch and breaker for the light uh, in the power pedestal. And then cable and he's got the internet connections on here too. Um, so my opinion, that's the way to go. But as you say, it's a lot of money. It, it, it's screaming, you're, you're absolutely, and, and not only that, but those ground fault devices probably aren't gonna last as long as the power pedestal because they're mechanical devices and in that environment, they could be um, problematic. <clears throat> Stray current in the marina versus out in the water. Once again, the source of power in the marina is a transformer someplace. So when, when you have stray current in the water, the electrical field can be huge. Um, it, it's that electricity wants to get back to the source of power and it could be, could be hundreds of feet away. So anything in between is a problem. <clears throat> Stray current in the marina is a larger concern because the circuit starts in the marina's electrical equipment and it comes back to where the fault is and it'll use the water to, to get the, uh, the current back to the source of power. Uh, generators, uh, generators are typically not a problem. You know, I've seen wives, you know, the generators running, the kids are swimming. Uh, oh, you can't do that when the generator is running, but it generally is fairly safe to have a boat anchored out in a generator running because the electrical field is so small. If there was a fault and there was something coming out of the boat, it wouldn't go very far before it went right back up into the boat. So it doesn't create a large field. <clears throat> now, in the case of something like this, where you have the, the one guy with the generator passing cords to his buddies that don't have one, then you have a bigger electrical field where you could have a problem. And there are examples of this where, where uh, somebody plugged into somebody's boat um, and, and the, the, the fault was on the, the boat that was receiving the power and the source of power was over here and the current ran through to back to the boat. So you need to be mindful of that when you're uh, um, in this kind of environment. Um, salinity, a lot of people get confused because salt water carries electricity better than fresh water. But the problem really is the salinity in salt water is about the same as the salinity in the body. So if you put electricity in the water, the current doesn't see the difference. But if you put electricity in fresh water, 
that, that current isn't happy. It's not satisfied. And when you put a body in there, the, the body carries the current far better than fresh water does. So it actually attracts the uh, electrical current to the body and, and causes problems for whoever that might be in the water. <clears throat> Some other frequently overlooked uh, things, I don't mean to beat up on the marinas, but they deserve it. Um, that, that they, they miss uh, ground fault protection shall be installed in accordance with NFPA 70, Article 555.3. It doesn't say what year. I mean, obviously, if the state is only adopted in 2011 or 14, there's some saving grace there. But, but my position is these marinas, they don't know what ground fault protection is. And when you suggest it to them, you know, they're saying it's going to cost me a fortune, you know. Uh, NFPA 303, um, I'm involved in a case right now in the Great Lakes where a kid was killed. And these people, the NFPA 303 requires an inspection of all the components at least annually. And this, this guy was a, 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 a municipal marina. They hadn't looked at any of that stuff for years. And these were floating docks that didn't come out of the water in the wintertime. Uh, they had a northeast exposure, so every time the wind blew out of the northeast, these docks were rocking and rolling. And eventually, uh, the current carrying conductors chafed into the metal frames of the dock, and, and the water, the green wire was taking the current back safely, but eventually, when the green wire broke, then it, it went to the next place, which was the water. Kenny? No, it doesn't. And but but um, you know, I mean, if the burden falls on the marina to have it inspected, and and you know, it, it to me, it it's not necessarily a skilled person. I mean, every marina should have an electrician on you know call or somebody that they use. And and but the the problem really is that the marina owner and manager. When I talk about this, when I go to marinas for whatever the reason might be, and I have enough time to talk to somebody about that, they don't have a clue what it is. And I blame the authority having jurisdiction. I mean, you know, I, I'm in the marina all the time, in marinas all the time. And I, I see the local fire marshal and, and building inspector walking down the dock and it's like, ah, oh, look at that sea ray. Yeah. My, uh, and they're not looking at anything uh, that, and really they, they, to some degree may not know. Uh, also in 303, there's a requirement, a separate statement uh, that the requirement shall include a test of the ground integrity. So you need to make sure that that green grounding wire is making it back to the source of power. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the circuit analyzers uh, later on here, and I think that's the, the key to that. Every marina should have a circuit analyzer, and every surveyor should as well. Another one that I see, uh, NFPA for years has said, if you've got a 15 or 20 amp breaker on the dock, it needs to be ground fault protected. And of course, it's a mechanical device and it might need to be swapped out every five years, but I still see the, the docks that don't have ground fault protection on the, the outlets that are used for equipment, buffing machines and things like that. Uh, another one, 303 requires a breaker within 30 inches of the outlet. And I still see plenty that don't have a breaker within 30 inches of the outlet. Here's another case here. This is a 50 amp uh, 240 with no breaker. This is a, a 30 amp 240. Now there's a breaker, but it's nowhere near the, the where you plug it in. And really you should have the breaker off when you plug the boat in and then turn the breaker on at the same time. This is a, a marina in Florida where the green grounding wire coming in was grounded to the box, which isn't, you know, a big deal, but there was no green grounding wire coming from the outlets that were coming back into the box. So that, that whatever boats were plugged in there, there was, there was no ability to take a ground fault on the boat back to the source of power. And if there was on any of the boats around this uh, particular dock here, uh, the, the fault current was running through the water. Here's another one that had no cover on it. I mean, a kid could reach in there and grab 50 amp 240. <clears throat> Here's a main power supply running through the water. Um, if you if you go to a marina with your eye towards electrical equipment in the marina, you'll always find something that is a head scratcher. And then here's another one where the neutral and the grounding conductors, when the tide was in, you know, was. This is another one down in Virginia that you know is just like uh, all the wires are run. The old ones, the new ones, the one that the. Uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln used was, you know, there's, they're all still hanging there. Some are working, some are not. 
There are many long-standing rules and regulations for marinas and boatyards. These rules are not regularly followed by the owners and managers of the marinas. Kenny, as you say, who's supposed to inspect it? You know, the marina needs to have it inspected. You know, if they get called upon it, you know, that somebody needs to inspect it. Many times, many times, the contractors and the AHJ are not familiar with the rules and regulations for electricity in the marina. Marine uh, electricity surveyors uh, should start a survey by checking the power at the marina's power pedestal, establish a baseline. Uh, problems should be reported in writing to the marina manager, separate of what you're doing. You don't have to share with the customer, but if you see something when you're checking the marina at the power pedestal, find a way to diplomatically mention it to the marina manager. You may get a customer out of this, somebody that, you know, he may be interested in what you know about that. My pet peeves and observations, I'm 67 now, and pet peeves come to me very easily these days. I don't know what it is, but certain things rub me the wrong way, so I have a collection of things here that I'll spend a, a couple minutes on. Uh, unprotected hot terminals. I still see a lot of unprotected hot terminals. Batteries, yeah, they're protected, but there's so many different hot terminals in a boat other than just the batteries that need to be covered. Here's another one here. This is, you know, in, a, in an engine room, no, no covers on all these hot terminals. <clears throat> hot terminals again, not not covered. Another installation, hot covered. Here's a here's another one here, uh, in in a compartment where there could be anything could lean into that that isolator, um, and it's not covered. Here's here's a number of of uh, hot terminals up here that should have maybe a piece of plastic on or something, but there there's a lot of hot terminals not covered. Uh, here's another example. Here's a, a, a battery box here that um, the, the, I guess the owner of the boat didn't, felt it was inconvenient uh, and he took the battery box off. Uh, this, this is an ocean yacht and, and the problem I have with this is the, uh, you can't get at the, 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 the cells of the batteries because of the way the thing's wired on top of the battery. You couldn't check the electrolyte in there if you wanted to. Here's another one that they mounted the batteries under the engine pan and again, you could very easily drop a wrench down in there and have, have some fireworks. I don't know whether anybody noticed, but uh, the isolator in the picture uh, isn't isolating very much here. <laughs> you know, the guy, guy, guy called a guy in and he paid him a lot of money and oh, I got a whole bunch of stuff done to the boat, but something's not working. Would you come look at it? I said, yeah. I said, first of all, your isolator's not, not wired correctly. Uh, next on my peeve list is uh, inverters and inverter chargers. They are typically aftermarket stuff and they're typically not installed properly. Uh, there's always something wrong with them. An inverter charger needs to have circuit protection both ways because it's charging or inverting. Um, installations uh, improper. Here's, here's one where somebody took the inverter. The, the guy, of course, didn't want to spend a lot of money. So they got a, an elementary basic inverter. It had a, 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 an outlet on the inverter. Um, uh, by the way, it's a ground fault outlet and inverters need a special ground fault device to work. You can't go to Home Depot and get a, a ground fault device and wire it into an inverter circuit. Uh, but in this case, the guy took the, the inverter apart and wired additional wires onto the outlet, the internal ground fault outlet in the device. And then he took them. And, and in this case, they're yellow and red. So that tells somebody that it's DC. It's not, it's AC. And here's another one where they wired a, um, they, they scabbed a, an inverter line onto a circuit breaker. Um, and in this case, you have the opportunity to energize that one circuit with two sources of AC electricity. Next pet peeve is uh, both side shore power connections. Um, smart plug came out with a new plug and all the standards describe the push in and twist type. So technically the smart plug didn't, um, didn't meet the standards. So the, the standards writers, NFPA and, and ABYC have backed off from that and say now it's a locking type. But this old twist type, um, a lot of times when, when it's plugged in, it's, it's, when it's plugged in properly, it's plugged in all the way. And the, the whole, this whole area is the mating surface. But when it's plugged in like this, it's like putting a piece of 14 gauge wire in a, in a 10 gauge wire circuit. 
So when it's not plugged in all the way, it, it's, it's a source of, of fires. Uh, as, as we see here, it's a, a boat that burned up. Here's another one here. And, uh, and this is what you wind up with in the, it, when, it's, when it's not plugged in and twisted. So however you do it, it needs to be plugged in and locked. Twist or the smart plug device, which is what these are here, which uh, is a nice product because when it goes in, it snaps in. It's a deliberate. Uh, and here is a very interesting uh, uh, ground fault, or, or, or I'm sorry, a, a sure power connection story. Uh, this is the Graysonville Fire Department fire boat. <laughs> and, and, and on Steve, you're... <laughs> Well, well, I, I, I mean, I don't know anything on the record, but I, I keep my own boat in that marina, and I was in the marina that night, and I actually have a scanner on my boat, and I heard the tones go off, and, and you know, there's like five or six tones go off, so I'm saying, oh, it sounds like a blaze, and the, then, then the, they say water box, which means it's a boat, and this fire boat was dispatched to this fire, <laughs> so... <laughs> So, so, uh, so I mean, it's literally, I'm on D dock. That's on C dock. I stick my head up and this thing's like going to beat the band. And the, the, um, uh, I mean, it stayed in the boat, but, but ultimately I'm told that it started at the shore power connection. And although NFPA 302, uh, 303 and NFPA one says no portable heaters on boats, I believe this boat had a portable heater on it. And, you know, unplugging that, that shore power cord a little bit by itself won't cause a problem. But if you have any kind of load on the boat, that causes the problem. And, and my unofficial uh, word on this fire was there was a heater on the boat, which created the draw that started the fire. In the, um, and Steve, if you want to correct me on that later on, <laughs> you can. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, this boat pretty much got, got total with the fire. But I, I, if I'm a betting man, I'm saying it's an onboard heater and an inefficient uh, shore power connection. Uh, next one I have a big problem with is voltage drop. Uh, National Electrical Code, voltage drop is caused by small wires and resistive connections. National Electrical Code calls for no more than 5%. Article 210, uh, prevent voltage drop exceeding 3% at the farthest outlet for a total not to exceed 5% voltage drop. When I take my circuit analyzer onto a boat and you have the guy, you know, the, the, the 150 foot dock, when they built the dock, you know, they were trying to save money. Is the, does everything come from the end of the dock and go back? Is it come to the middle of the dock and go in and out? Um, but the, ultimately the sport fish at the T head of the dock might not be getting what he thought he was getting electricity wise. In addition to that, you take a boat builder who wants to make his boat fast and light and save money. And is he using the proper size wire inside the boat? So you, know, you take your circuit analyzer to the farthest outlet, maybe up in the V bunk in a big 50 foot sport fish boat. And you're going to see 12 and 13% voltage drop in there, maybe even more. So voltage drop is a big concern of mine. Uh, neutral to ground connectors. Um, there's, there's too many times when the neutral and the ground is connected on the boat. There's a few ways to go through testing that and figure out how to, how to get them out, but uh, um, and figure out whether you have one or not. Um, but uh, I'm sorry, I'm one, one behind. It could be you have an appliance on the boat where the neutral to ground connection is made there, uh, but it's something... Um, uh, you need to be mindful of. <clears throat> you should be able to unplug the boat and check the neutral to ground connector inside the boat. Uh, it should read open line when there is no connection. Uh, the next one uh, is um, overall cathodic protection. A lot of times we don't check for overall cathodic protection. It's simple to do. You need a reference cell, drop it in the water. You don't have to go into the engine room. The, um, the, um, you should be able to take a reading of the whole boat's uh, overall cathodic protection uh, via a grounding connection uh, on, a, on an outlet somewhere inside the boat. Uh, surveyors 
typically when I'm around in a survey, they don't do the, uh, um, they don't check the overall cathodic protection. It's simple to do. Uh, of course, this is where you should be. That, that, picture, uh, that last picture was taken uh, just before a boat was hauled out of the water, so it was very close to being uh, minimal. <clears throat> uh, electric diagnostic equipment, this is uh, um, wrapping up my program here. Um, uh, AC circuit analyzers. Uh, everybody should have one. Um, uh, spend the money, they're 250 bucks. Um, find out what they do for you and, and understand the information that it gives you. Uh, every marina should have one of these. If you have one of these, a kid can check and do the 303 inspection and ground fault detection uh, that uh, is required by the NFPA. Uh, when you're doing a survey, you want to go to the dock, you want to measure the dock voltage, you want to measure the dock voltage drop, you want to show, if, 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 uh, AC circuit analyzers will show open grounds. Uh, so if the ground's not making it back, uh, you can measure the resistance on each leg. You could see if there's a resistive leg in there. You could check the dock's polarity. You could test the GFCIs if there is one in the power pedestal. Uh, you may be able to test, it will test 30 milliamp devices, and it gives you a baseline for establishing what you're going to see when you go in the boat. So you should record these things. You should write them down. Then when you get in the boat, you check again and you check the boat's voltage. So if your voltage drop, for instance, was 8% on the dock and 9% on the boat, then you don't have a big voltage drop problem on the boat. But if the voltage drop was on was 8% on the dock, you know that's a problem. And then when it's 17 or 18% on the boat, then you know you have two problems there. Uh, same thing, you could show an, an open or resistive ground. You could see a neutral to ground current, um, and you could check an LC or a ground fault device. If, you, you sit it in there and you, and you go to ground fault. Uh, you, can, you can trip the ground fault device, the LC, to see if it's doing the job it was intended to do. Uh, the, the, la the third reason for a, a, a circuit analyzer is generator output. You know, I, I, we run the generator. We don't know whether we're getting 60 hertz or 50 hertz or whatever it might be. So, so a, a, an AC circuit analyzer, and I have two with me that uh, later on I'll put in the tables and as you know, lunchtime or something, if you guys want to check them out, you can see what they'll do. Spend the money for an AC circuit analyzer and then spend the time to read the information and understand what it's telling you. Uh, AC circuit analyzers are 15 and 20 amp devices, uh, so you'll need adapters to check marina power. 30 amp adapters are easily found. I made my own 50 amp adapter, which will be here and you can look at that. You could ask questions. Uh, I have two meters and two circuit analyzers. And when I go to, to, to a boat, I plug uh, one of the meters and one of the circuit analyzers into an outlet someplace, and I kind of leave it sit there so I can check the generator output and things like that. And then I walk around with the other two. Uh, X-Tech CT70 is the one I like the best. Um, the nice thing about that is if there's something wrong, the screen turns red. So a marina, for instance, can give this to a 16-year-old kid, give him a list of all the, the slip numbers and tell him to go put the, the device into each slip. And if it turns red, write down which box, which uh, power pedestal it was. This one here is showing an open ground. That's what you see. That means this, there's no ground in that, that uh, power supply right there. This is the 50 amp device that I have. And you basically have to check two uh, 110 legs independent of one another. You'll be redundant when you're checking the grounding capability and the neutral, but the, the reason you do it to both is because there's two hot legs on a 50 amp 240 service. Here's the, uh, here's the device here that you'll see a little bit later on, and here's the sure test, which is also a good device, and there's a great 15-minute YouTube presentation on this device um, that uh, will help you understand what it's going to do for you and why you need one. <clears throat> Here's another. This is the sure, sure test. Uh, it, it doesn't change colors uh, when there's a problem, but there's the sure test uh, showing no, no ground as well. Surveyors should elevate their approach to evaluating AC electricity on the boats they're surveying. Um, surveyors play a very important role um, in the regulation and of our basically unregulated industry and keeping it that way. Um, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I'll be around all day, uh, have some cards. 
uh, and I'll put my gear out on the table there if anybody's like to see it or has any questions, uh, please let me know. Thank you very much.